Uh, open with me to your Bibles to Psalm 10. And just to give you a quick introduction to this psalm, first and foremost, you have a lot of Bible commentators that suggest that this is a sequel to Psalm 9. I think a lot of people like sequels. I grew up loving sequels. I remember Terminator 2. That was one of my favorite movies growing up as a kid. I'm not trying to endorse Terminator or anything like that. But sequels rarely are, are that great. But whether or not this is a sequel, obviously all of Scripture is great in itself. And a lot of Bible commentators believe because there's a lot of similarities between Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 that David was the author of this, even though there is no given author in the Scripture. It's called an orthanic psalm, basically just a psalm with an unknown author. So there are 39 of them in the book of Psalms. This is the third in the book itself. And so we have here some comparisons, rather some contrast in regards to the psalms. Uh, both contrast the greatness of the Lord to the weakness of those who turn to evil. Uh, both prophesy judgment and both also call on to the Lord to rise up and to bring justice, and both of them also have very encouraging endings uh, to the respective psalms. So as we examine the text this morning, and if you've really looked into Psalm 9 uh, any time recently, you'll, you'll definitely see some comparisons, and you'll be saying, yeah, I can see why those commentators think that, because, again, the language is very similar as well. So we're going to break this study up into four sections. Section number one, we're going to be talking about the bondage of the oppressed. Section number two, and the meatiest part of the study, we're going to be spending a lot of time in this this morning, the bondage of the oppressor or oppressors. And there's going to be a lot of tough scripture to go through in this in terms of, uh, I guess you can say, the shortcomings that come with being an oppressor that are described by the psalmist. So you'll have to bear with us and know that you know, good, bad, and ugly, the scripture is a scripture, and we are going to be telling you the truth of it. Uh, number three, a call to justice, verses 12 through 15, and finally, liberation of the oppressed in verses 16 through 18. Let's open up in a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning and to hear from you. We pray, Lord, that you would use this fallible man, Lord, to share your perfect word. God, we know that you use so many people that have so many shortcomings to your glory. And Lord, we pray that this morning you would be the one glorified. We lift up our pastor and his wife. We pray for their safety as they head to their destination. Lord, may Cynthia just be blessed today on her birthday. And may you bless the entire Garcia family. And Lord, again, we ask that your spirit would lead us, God. Speak through me, Lord. May we all receive what you have for us this morning. We love you. We praise you. And again, we thank you for this divine appointment that you've made. In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning in verse number one, we see a couple of questions being asked. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? So we're seeing here that... The psalmist himself, whether it's David or anyone else, is going through some kind of trial, some kind of oppression. And so we ourselves have asked those questions to the Lord in any given time in our life. You can probably recount times that you've gone through some sort of hardship where you're asking the Lord, where are you? Why are you distant? Why are you hiding? Why am I alone? I feel alone. I mean, we have those times where we just feel like we're utterly alone. And you see plenty of examples of that in Scripture, and we see an Old Testament example in Elijah. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, and as you turn there, Elijah himself just came off an incredible victory at the Mount of Carmel, or Mount Carmel, and he had been used by the Lord to proclaim him, and the people got to see God Almighty bring down his holy fire and consume the sacrifice that was laid out by Elijah. And Elijah, mind you, poured lots of water on it because, humanly speaking, it wouldn't have been able to be lit up, but God lit it up. And consequently, on the other side, you had the worshipers of Baal, the priests of Baal that were 
doing their chants. And you can see the futility of, of their paganism, the futility of worshiping anything other than the Lord. And of course, these priests all died at the hand of Elijah himself. So God had given him this great victory. But right after that victory, he turned around and ran. He had a trial by the name of Jezebel. And this trial wanted to kill him and basically sent out a message to him saying, hey, we are going to take you out before this day is done, before the 24-hour period is done. You are going to be gone. That scared Elijah. He, he went a-running. And so the Lord at this point is ministering to Elijah because Elijah is very discouraged here as we get into verse 14. And he, being Elijah, said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. This is the second time that Elijah says this to the Lord. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return your way on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Verse 17, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And so we see Elijah in this situation where he himself is distant from God. Obviously, you here you have the situation where God has given him this great victory, and all of a sudden he runs. He, he wasn't drawing close to God. If he was, he wouldn't have been running. He wouldn't have feared one queen when he took down 450 prophets by himself. And so obviously he wasn't really tuned in to the Lord and he was given in to his fear and ran away, but God in his love and mercy for Elijah continued to minister to him and to encourage him as well and say, you know what, I'm not done with you quite yet. We got your successor lined up, but there's some missions I still have for you. God had everything in place. God has a plan and he had a plan for Jezebel, judgment for her as well as Ahab and his descendants. And that goes back in scripture a little bit. But he also had a, just a whole big plan in mind for the potential judgment of Israel because he loves Israel so much. But another thing too, he addresses Elijah's perspective. The perspective of, Lord, I'm it. I'm the only one left. They've killed prophets. They've killed people, brothers and sisters. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be done. But God reassures him, hey, Elijah, I have 7,000 Israelites, as in not Judah, but in Israel, reserved for me who have not worshipped Ball. So he's telling Elijah, you're not the only one. You're not the only one serving me. So he's encouraging him with that and keeping him going along. And so we see in Revelation chapter 3, verses 20, the very fact that God himself is not distant from any one of us. Here's what Jesus says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with them, and he with me. So in a nutshell, the Lord is never distant. It's, if anything, the Lord is waiting for us to have fellowship with him each and every day. If there's a day that maybe you just get really busy, and, and for whatever reason, you don't feel like you had time for devotion, and then you get a tugging on your heart that you just didn't spend time with him. That's the Lord tugging at you, saying, hey, what about me? Please spend time with me. I love you so much. Just like the relationships you have with your husbands, your wives, your kids, other family members or friends that just want to spend that time with you. God, even more so, wants to spend that time with you as well. That's the kind of Lord that we serve. One that wants relationship with us. He's never distant from you. As the psalmist, unfortunately, didn't see at that particular juncture of the text. And so we get into the second section, which is going to be, again, kind of a rough patch. There's going to be some rough topics that we're going to expound on a little bit. And it's on the bondage of the oppressor. So we start with verse 2. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. 
Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boast of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Verse 5, his ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above out of his sights. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. Verse 8, he sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches a poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches. He lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. Verse 11, he has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. So in a nutshell, what we're seeing here from the psalmist in this particular section of Scripture is a profile of the oppressor, the characteristics he's lying out of the oppressor. And it's important before we actually get into those characteristics to really get into the meat of the matter, the heart of the matter of what's going on here. And it really can be expounded upon from John the... the the John the Revelator is what I call him, but uh, the Apostle John. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, there's what he says. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I don't know how many of you remember this teaching from Pat Doucette where he's talking about three different lures that Satan would use to get people hooked in any particular genre of sin, as you will. These three are described in this particular verse. The lust of the flesh would essentially means a person's sensual desires or somewhere along the lines of an example of being sex. And you see that Satan has used the vehicle of pornography to victimize so many people. It is such a lucrative business that it has made more money than all the sports franchises combined. It's hooked that many people. That is an example of the lust in the flesh. Second is lust of the eyes, which essentially is coveting something that someone already has. You see someone's house. All of a sudden, you have that desire for that house or their car or their jacket or, or whatever it is. Lust of the eyes. Third, pride of life, which essentially means you're conceited. It means you're arrogant. It means that you are having this ambition of your own self, self-display, self-glorification, putting yourself above other people, having the mentality of, I'm better than this person, I'm better than that person, I'm better than most people. That is an example there of the pride of life. So you look through these verses, and some of them really jump out at you. We're talking about verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 that really hit on the issue of pride. You see the signs of pride in the oppressor. So my question for you, ladies and gentlemen, is where does pride come from? Does Satan himself, in those lures, drop these supposed, I guess you can say, toxins? Pride toxins in the air? We just breathe them in and all of a sudden we're prideful? The answer is no. The answer is, because of our fallen nature, we struggle with that in our hearts. The verses of Obadiah 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And some of you may think, well, that sounds pretty cruel. I thought I was supposed to follow my heart. Well, that's what the world teaches you. And of course, we've seen the sad results of following your heart. It's amazing. Not so amazing, really. It's not a surprise. We got so much issues with pride in our culture. You see that it's glorified to some degree at least. The fact of the matter is, you, you look back in Genesis chapter 3, where even before that time, there was that harmony that mankind had with God. And then when Adam and Eve fell, that harmony was severed because sin entered the camp. All of a sudden, we have a sin nature. And that sin nature, too, is, is rooted in 
the heart. But thank goodness we had that plan of redemption that the Lord had in place. Throughout all the scripture you read, His plan of redemption coming forth from beginning to end, where He brings about His only Son, Jesus Christ, to commit that one act of selflessness, that supreme act of love in dying on the cross so we would have that connection restored potentially if we give our lives to Jesus Christ. And so that's what he done for us. So I want to give you seven signs of an oppressor's heart. So we're going to go through this particular section in that capacity. So we're going to reveal seven signs that the Lord has, has shown me through the course of the time that I've had to, to study this text. First and foremost, the first sign of the oppressed, simply put, they oppress. In some cases, we're going to go through these uh, pretty rapidly. Some of them we'll spend a little bit more time on, so bear with me. So they oppress or they persecute. And we see that in verse 2. The wicked in his pride, there it is, I'm better than everyone else, I'm superior, I'm an elitist, is basically persecuting the poor, persecuting those that are disadvantaged. And we know God himself has a heart for the poor. And we know since the oppressor doesn't have a relationship with God, he's against God. So he's going against the people that God has a heart for. And we see that here in this verse. In his pride, he persecutes the poor. And then there's that call, let them be caught in the plots that they have devised. You see the cry of the psalmist coming out in this verse. And so we see many examples of oppression just here and now in present day. I mean, we see our brothers and sisters. We see stories of them losing their lives to ISIS, other kinds of persecutions going on because they may not have the political pull or, or what have you, but because they represent Jesus Christ, they themselves are being persecuted. You see it just in this country, the stronger preying on the weaker. You see people that decide that they want to take advantage of other people. You see it all the time, and that's just a byproduct of not having that communion with God Almighty. So either which way, this is something that continues to happen. Uh, number two, in verse three, they're greedy. And immediately you're thinking, well, that's not necessarily a pride issue. It could be qualified as uh, lust of the eyes because, you know, greed could be generated that way. You're greedy for someone's car or whatever it is. Um, you look in verse 3 where the psalmist says the wicked blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. That's the New King James Version. The uh, North American Standard Bible says, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. So either which way you put it, whether it's blesses the greedy or the greedy man altogether, whether that's the greedy guy or whether it's just someone who's wanting to support that greedy guy, there's an endorsement for that ungodly characteristic. 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul says to Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There's a verse right there that hits on the topic of greed. It's not money that's the root of all evil. That's something I was taught at a young age. That was false. But it's the love of money. It's not bad to have money. It's not bad to have wealth. It's bad that wealth and riches have your heart. That's the bad thing. That's something that we need to make sure that we bring to the Lord, that those things do not have us, even though it's okay for us to have them. Jesus says in Matthew 6 and Luke 16 that nobody can serve two masters. You either serve God or mammon, and mammon essentially is physical wealth or money. Jesus Christ himself saying that you cannot serve both. The third characteristic or the third sign of an oppressor's heart, they are foolish. And you look at verse 4, and you're like, well, how's that foolish, Rob? The wicked in his heart, or rather the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. It's important first and foremost to focus on the word countenance. And you look at the Hebrew background with this. Countenance in Hebrew is af, which kind of confusingly means nose. Okay, where are you going at with this, Rob? Well, in context of that, it's, it's the face that you put on. So, for example, if someone has a hot nose, they're described as being angry or upset. 
And then if someone has a long nose, they're described as being patient, which I didn't think was the case. I thought it meant that you were a liar because, you know, Pinocchio, remember that? That, that was my thought. But then you have high of nose, which is the case here, which means arrogance or proud countenance. And again, the New King James says, does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Evident there that they are blocking God out intentionally. The ESV, the English Standard Version, basically puts it this way. All of his thoughts are, there is no God. And we see this movement today where atheism itself is being embraced and accepted in our universities, accepted in our culture. People looking for excuses to put God away, to separate God from this country, to separate God from our culture, because the United States was founded by, in many cases, a bunch of godly men. You know, there's, there's a bunch of godly things about the Constitution, about uh, the preamble, the Founding Fathers were men, in many respects, again, that were following the Lord and wanted to found this country upon the principles of God. And that has slowly but surely eroded. So you have this popular mentality that there is no God. People are looking for excuses to turn away. Because David says in Psalm 19, verse 1 through 4, God's creation itself testifies of him. Paul, in Romans 1, expounds on the same thing about God's creation all around us in the fact that we have no excuse when we come to meet the Lord. No excuse at all, based on what we see around us, that God does indeed exist. Not only that, that we accept the Lord. You know, there's a picture here that I have that means a lot to me. It hangs up in, in uh, my wife's and mine uh, living room. This picture actually comes from my great-grandfather, and back in the day when he was alive, he retired in Phoenix, and we would go up and visit him, and he would take us out to restaurants, and every time he would take us out, or at least most times, he would take a pen out, and he would grab a napkin and start drawing on it. This is one of those napkins that he drew on. He was quite the artist. And so it was a blessing for me to actually have this stored, and my wife being the loving wife she is, she loves picture frames. You can see she does a really good job at, at putting pictures together. And she, she, she does this with pictures, she does this with letters, she, she has them framed all over the house. It's, it's quite a sight to see. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. But the point is, my great-grandfather being the author of this painting, my question to you is, do you need to see my great-grandfather to know that he actually did this painting? The answer is no. We know by this that someone drew this. We know someone created this wonderful piece of art with something as simple as a napkin. So my question to you is, how can it be difficult for people to basically say, I don't see God? In all of creation, you go outside your house, you see the trees bustling, you see the desert landscape, you, you see the clear blue skies. How can you not say that there is a God? Because you see all the evidence right in front of you just by the creation, just by the universe, just by the cosmos. And there's a verse that God has for someone with that perspective, and that would be, if you turn your Bible, maybe a page, or maybe it's the same page, depending on what Bible you have. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so for someone to say, there is no God, for someone to say, I'm atheist, it's foolishness. It's absolutely foolish to say that, based on all the evidence that you see. And if you are a believer who has struggles in talking to someone who's an atheist, who's demanding proof of a God. There may be a study guide that can help you out. There's a pastor by the name of Charlie Campbell. And a number of years ago, he had a teaching called The Existence of God, which was, I mean, just an awesome teaching. I mean, he uses scripture, but he uses 
also things that are scientific and philosophical to talk about the existence of God. And the ministry is called Always Be Ready. So you can go to the website, alwaysbeready.com, and there should be a teaching on there. I don't know if it's something you can download online or something you, you can purchase, but it is something that has blessed me in my walk with the Lord where he's giving these different reasonings, and you're like, man, that really makes sense. And so he gave a similar reason that I gave you with my grandfather's picture. Just simple, basic, logical explanations to make an atheist really think about where they stand. Really think about, is this really true? Is what I believe really legitimate? To get them to really think about that. Number four, as we continue on. Someone who's an oppressor. They are spiritually blind, as we see in verse 5. Even though the psalmist initially starts the verse saying, his ways are always prospering, and what a deception that is, where we think that all these A-list actors and musicians and all the people that we know are not submitted to the Lord, that they appear to have it all together. The fact is, it's quite the opposite. They don't. You hear other stories that they're either committing suicide or they're getting involved in drugs or getting in some kind of trouble with the law. So they, in truth, don't have it together. We only have it together when we have the Lord. But as we continue on in verse 5, getting to the point, your judgments are far above, out of their sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. Again, the end is kind of a pride statement. But your judgments are far above, out of their sight is an indication that either A, uh, this oppressor doesn't realize what's going on. They are spiritually blind, or for that matter, even spiritually dead. Anyone that's not in a relationship with Christ doesn't have spiritual life altogether. And so we see that. Or they can be so prideful that they can say, well, I heard about this God that judges, and I'm far above that. You know what I mean? Someone who has that elitist mentality, like, I'm above all that stuff. That could be the case as well. Pride having a really strong grip on this person, as we see in verse 5. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before the destruction of and a haughty spirit. They're in for a rude awakening at some point. So we go on to number five, which covers verse 6, 11, and for that matter, even 13 touches up on it a little bit, where he is saying in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity in verse 6. Verse 11, he has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. And verse 13b, he has said in his heart, you will not require an account. Each and every time the statement is being made, he has said in his heart, he's being deceived by his own heart. Again, the Proverbs verse on pride coming before the destruction. I mean, of course, we are not indestructible. You know, I remember when I was in, I think, junior college, and I had the mentality that my car was not so much a responsibility, it was more of a, I guess you can say, a, like a ride, you know, this is going to be fun, I'm just going to drive around. And, you know, I didn't take enough caution. I got into an accident and I saw, and I, I drove a Nissan Sentra, 1987 Sentra, and I saw as the accident happened, I mean, I remember it to this day as if you have the, the hood of your car crumple quickly like it was just a piece of styrofoam. And I was going maybe 35, 40 miles an hour. It just went, whack. It's fortunate my legs didn't, get crushed in that accident. God obviously had his grace on me uh, that particular day. Verse 6, or rather number 6, he has a foul mouth which talks about verse 7. Here's another rough thing here to talk about. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. The psalmist describing the mouth of the oppressor being full, abundant of cursing or cussing uh, deception or even threatening speech. And going back to my life, the first 24 years of my life, I picked up those things. I didn't think anything of those things. And even, you know, shortly before I came to know the Lord, I was blessed that God put a grandmother in my life that loved God, that loved Him, and that ministered to me. And I knew that foul language was wrong. I knew it was. And around her, 
you know what I mean? It was one of those things you just did your best to control yourself there. I mean, there was that conviction that God gives unbelievers. I see it in my own life today where people blurt out a cuss word and apologize. Oh, Rob, I didn't know you were here. I'm sorry. You know, that's what God does. You know, Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it's one of the Bible's commands that we are to rid ourselves. We are to put away this kind of stuff in our mouth. And, you know, when I first got saved, it wasn't something that was immediate. It, was, it took some time for the Lord to really minister to me on that. Um, but when you seek the Lord, He's faithful in doing those things, in making you salt and light, in sharpening you, and in making you more into the image of Jesus Christ and less into the person that you once were. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Jesus Christ addresses this issue, although initially He's dealing with the Pharisees who as many of you know, were interested in putting people under their bondage, under their yoke, under their man-made traditions instead of a relationship with the one and true God. Matthew 15, starting with verse 15, Jesus addressing Peter, because Jesus was telling the Pharisees, it's not what you put in that defiles you, it's what comes out. He's talking about the ritual washing. He was dealing with that. They put such emphasis on washing. They were telling Jesus, why aren't your disciples washing their hands? And Jesus is saying, that's not the, the heart of the matter. That's not the important thing. But here he is addressing Peter when Peter's not getting it. And sometimes we don't. Peter's like, I don't get it. Here's what he says in verse 15. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So he didn't understand it was a parable to him. Verse 16, Jesus responds, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. And so, again, it goes back to the heart issue. Jesus addressing that. You know, the, the foul language, the... The, the hurtful words that we say come from the heart, come from pride, come th from the things that the enemy gives us. And God wants us to surrender those things to him. And finally, number seven, simply put, they murder, verses 8 through 10. And you look at this really carefully. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. And he has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He will hide his face. He will never see. So here you are in a position where, again, this is reminiscent of the very first sign they oppress. This is just oppression to the point of death, um, at least to some, in some cases. And so we look at these verses and we see the character of Satan himself because 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 describes Satan as walking around like a roaring lion looking to see who he can devour. And we see that same character there because in truth, the oppressor, even though the oppressor may not admit it, may be saying, well, I'm just serving myself. If you're not serving God, you're, you're on the enemy's side. And so we see the character of the enemy in these particular Verses, And we know the enemy wants to seek and destroy. The enemy hates all mankind, not just Christians, but non-Christians alike because we are all made in the image of God. And because of our association with God, Satan hates us. And he knows his time is short. And he knows that he is going to suffer for eternity in the lake of fire. And he wants to take as many people as possible with him. In his last great effort in that, or one of his last great efforts, he's going to come back later on and try to turn Jesus' kingdom against him. That's a whole other teaching, but he's going to bring about the Antichrist very, very soon to lead more people away to himself. So we got a look of the oppressor, and again, many of these characteristics embody Satan himself. So we continue on in the third section Call for justice, verses 12 through 15. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? 
He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen, for you observed trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. And so we see a similarity. This is why some people believe, again, or at least an example, why some people believe David might be the author of the psalm, because in Psalm 9, the psalm that he's credited to writing, he says the same words, Arise, O Lord. And so we see that again. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. The call for the Lord to rise up. Lift up his hand. That's a figure of speech for his control, his power, his strength, his direction. Lord, bring it. We need your help. Bring it, God. So even though the psalmist calls on the Lord not to forget as we continue on in this verse, when you learn more about the character of God Almighty, you know that he doesn't forget. And I have a few psalm examples to share with you in that. Psalm 1827, for you will save the humble people as in God, but will bring down the haughty looks. Psalm 147, 6, the Lord lift up the humble. He cast the wicked to the ground. Psalm 149.4, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. And humble, in case I didn't give this definition earlier, is basically the opposite of pride. It's putting others above yourself. It's being lowly, giving preference to your brother or sister. Being in the food line and seeing someone come in that you know is really hungry and saying, take my place. We're seeing a, a, a crowded auditorium of seats, but the Lord giving that conviction, give that person your spot. Be moved by the Lord to give of yourself and to be a selfless individual and not being a selfish individual. And not only does the Lord stand by the humble, but he himself has given us the ultimate example of humility in his life here on earth 2,000 years ago and in his death he exhibited that ultimate humility example that we all can glean from. And there's a book from Andrew Murray, not that I'm trying to endorse products, but these uh, particular ministry, I guess you can say texts have really helped me. There's a book called Humility by Andrew Murray. And there's a specific chapter that deals with the life of Jesus Christ in terms of the issue of humility, how we all can learn from our Savior, especially in the realm of humility. Verse 13, we see a verse that mirrors verse, the second part of verse 3, the wicked being deceived by, by their own hearts and basically saying God will not require an account, which is absolutely false. God does require an account. You remember the parable of the servants that were given talents. And when the master came back, guess what they had to do? Give an account. So we all have to give an account to the Lord. The grace that he gives us, are we giving that grace to other people as well? You know, other things in life that, that God requires of us, gives us stewardship of for us, or allows us to have stewardship of, to where we ourselves can give an account to the Lord. So that is absolutely not true. That's just the base mindset that we're seeing in the oppressed. Verse 14, the very first part, we're... The psalmist is saying, you have seen, you have observed trouble and grief. So the psalmist is seeing that, that this is something God does not get taken by surprise with. He knows, he sees everything that's going on. This isn't taking him aback. To repay it by your hand, again, to basically respond by his might, his power. Remember, the, the hand represents that, or the arm. It represents the might or the power. You know, you, you see the label arm and hammer, you see that arm, that, res, that embodies strength, the strength of the Lord. And you see in the second part of verse 14, very important not to miss this, the helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. And, and this part really is personal to me, and I'll get into that in a second, but look at the word commits. In the Hebrew, it's azah. And that essentially means to leave, loose, forsake, or abandon. The helpless is going to forsake himself or herself for the Lord, i.e. taking the focus off ourselves and putting it on God himself. And the personal part comes where the psalmist is saying, you are the helper of the fatherless. And I remember 
as some of you in this room have also lost your parent. I, 10 years ago, this coming Thanksgiving, lost my dad. He died of a heart attack, and I wasn't even in town. And for me, it was one of the most troublesome, grievous days of my life because this man, my father, had been such an integral part of my life. Was he a Christian most of his life? No, he wasn't. But he was there for his son. He loved on his son. He taught me how to be a man. He encouraged me. He was there. You know, sons need their fathers, and I was blessed to have mine, and I know that there are, there are boys out there today that don't have dads. And that's a travesty in itself. Fathers choose not to be dads. But I was blessed to have a father, and when I lost him, it was a night. I don't remember crying as much before or even after the fact. It was a devastation to me to lose him. And in that time, I really sought the Lord. And when I really started taking the focus off myself and really just seeking God and looking to Him, that's where I experienced his peace and his strength through it. Now, I can sit here and tell you, are, are you sad for the loss of your dad? Absolutely. To this day, I, I will be sad the rest of my life to be apart from my father. I love him. And he was there for me, and he loved on me, and he was someone who was sacrificial you know, for my needs and my brother and my sister's needs. And you, you look at that, and you're impacted by that. And in my own personal case, there's things I want to say to him about my marriage and how blessed I am to have the wife that I have. She has never met my father, but I'm looking forward to that meeting one day. I really am. But it's one of those things that's with you the rest of your life, but God gives you the peace and the strength to carry on, and for that matter, for me personally, it's allowed me to depend more upon my Heavenly Father anyway, which we need to do. As we continue on, in verse 15, this is more of a judgmental kind of verse where God's bringing His judgment here in verse 15, where the psalmist getting into the topic of judgment. There is a quote by Bible commentary William McDonald, who says, The Lord will hear the cry of the faithful by breaking the arm of the wicked and by exposing his wickedness until every last vestige is punished. And breaking the arm of the wicked doesn't necessarily mean physically breaking their arm, but breaking the strength of the wicked. The wicked strength will falter. That's the promise that we're getting here from the psalmist. And to seek out his wickedness until the Lord finds none implies that there is going to be a finality. The judgment will be total and final, and we're going to see that in the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. And so we get into the last section of Scripture, the liberation of the oppressed, where it starts like this. A very encouraging start. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. And you see the very first line in verse 16, the Lord is king. Yahweh, Jehovah, is the royal ruler forever and ever. And it simply means that, which basically implies everlasting. Future continues. It's a never-ending future, and it's glorious to get that promise based especially on the world that we live in today where we see so many things going awry, so much corruption. So many people hurting, so many people starving, so many people suffering. And that will come to an end. The nations have perished out of his land. You, you see prophecies, in particular, I think of Daniel. You know, in Daniel chapter 2, telling King Nebuchadnezzar that all these kingdoms are going to come. They're going to be powerful, mighty kingdoms, but none compared to the kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom coming of Jesus Christ. And we see a reflection of that promise here. And verse 17, an example of God's connection with the humble. You know, God, remember, exalts the humble. There's that connection. When you humble yourself before the Lord, you are going to hear from Him. Maybe not at that second. Maybe not the way you want to hear your message. 
that he has for you, but he's got a message and he's faithful in giving that in his time. The Lord has heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. And so God continues to prepare us. He continues to minister to us. And it's important to know that there's mention two times of the Lord hears. It's important to know, guys, that the Lord hears. You're not praying to nobody. You are praying to the Almighty God. He hears you. And the psalmist wants to make that clear in verse 17. And finally, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. The promise, again, that God is faithful in bringing justice to those who have been victimized, or for that matter, are victimized. For those who, again, are suffering. And, of course, this relates to the body of Christ. Since the church began, since Christ instituted a church up until this day, you've seen and heard stories of persecutions, and it's, it's, it's ramped up, obviously, within the last century and beyond. God will bring justice. And you see the promise at the very end. The man of the earth may oppress no more. In other words, once Christ comes to reign, that's it. There will not be any more wicked or earthly rulers. That will come to pass. We are going to be ruled in righteousness and peace. No more crying, no more sorrow, no more shame. It is going to be a beautiful time, and it's going to last for eternity. And that's a comfort that we can take. The ultimate for the life of someone who chooses Christ as their Lord is freedom from oppression. We have that as Christians now, spiritually speaking. But that doesn't mean oppression hasn't stopped in the world, but the psalmist is promising that it will stop. What an encouragement that is if you're discouraged this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you, Lord, that when we cry for help, it doesn't fall upon deaf ears. We know, Lord, that you're sovereign, that you're in control, and we may not understand every situation. But, Lord, we don't need to. We need to trust in you and to know, Lord, that you and you alone are our deliverer. And so, Lord, we pray as we are about to take communion now, that we would be men and women that take this time to recognize the gift that you've given us because your scripture does commission us, Lord, to, to just take the time to really reflect of what you've done and to honor you, Lord, and to seek you and to draw close to you. So, Lord, we thank you again and we praise you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. So before Joseph leads us in worship, I want to give you some scripture in the 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul talking about the very topic of communion. And here's what he says, starting with verse 23. If I receive from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who drinks and eats in an unworthy manner drinks and eats judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So as Joseph leads us in this time of worship, we are going to take a few moments to seek the Lord because we don't want to take communion in an unworthy manner. I'm assuming most of you are Christians in here, but if you're not, we encourage you not to take communion because you need to have a relationship with the Lord. You want to take it in a worthy manner. All it is is giving your life to Jesus Christ. Confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead. Asking him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And you're saved. But if there's anything that you have in your life that's holding you back from the Lord, if there's any wrong that you have committed against someone or if you're not forgiving someone of a wrong committed against you take that up with the Lord or if you're thinking well Rob I don't know what I did wrong well take that up with the Lord ask him Lord if there's anything if there's anything unclean about me please reveal it to me
please wash me clean. So we're going to take this time right now to seek the Lord. And then we'll take communion together. Is the blood of Jesus that sets us free? And by the blood of Jesus, we've been represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was tortured and beaten and broken for us. And of course, the grape juice that's symbolic for the blood of the Lord that was spilled to make that covenant with us. It was made by Him. It was nothing that we've done. But He made a way for us to have that eternal freedom. So let's now partake of these elements be in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you, God, that we would have this time, Lord, to hear your word this morning, to worship you, to come here for fellowship, and, of course, to hear your word being taught. We pray, Lord, that all this week that we would allow you to refresh us, to strengthen us, and Lord, that we would take time out of our day, Lord, to spend with you because you love us so much, God, and you want to be with us now. And we have that promise that we're together forever, but Lord, our relationship with you doesn't start down the road, it's now. And so we pray, Lord, that we would have that mindset, Lord, that we would have that conviction of heart to spend that time with you. May we do so this week. May you bless all my brothers and sisters as we all have different things going on and different journeys that we're taking through the week. May we just seek you in all those things. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen.